I'm uh, thankful to the committee for inviting me to speak, and I'm very humbled and honored uh, for this. And Jackie, I honor your service, uh, your years of service to Western, and especially for your concern for the employees' well-being. Let's focus for a moment on wellness. What is it? What does it mean? I've given talks like this for over 30 years. And I must say that at 66, my ideas about wellness are a little different than they were at 30. For many of us, 30 is when we first recognize that we're mortal. Up until that time, we can do about anything, drink anything, eat anything, and get over it in a weekend. Uh, but by 30, we realize that if we don't take care of this body, uh, it might not last. By my age, we're usually fin uh, facing some chronic condition of some sort, uh, diabetes, heart trouble, high blood pressure, prostate problems, gynecologic issues. So can you really talk about wellness if you're suffering for some kind of chronic malady? I believe we can. Someone once asked professor, former President Eisenhower's personal physician the secret to a, to a long, active, healthy life, and he said, Get a chronic medical condition and take good care of it. <laughs> good advice. So now, uh, I believe my definition of wellness is striving for the best function and quality of life possible. So much of life has to do with attitude. George Burns once said, people, some people start practicing to be old when they're very young. So here comes the, bite, the advice, and the difference between this and what I do in the office is I don't use a microphone in the office, and I promise I won't charge you for this time together. <laughs> I've said for many years that the advice that I give to people comes about one-third from my family, uh, one-third from my medical training, and one-third from Sunday school. I'm going to leave it to you to decide what part of my talk comes from what, and I don't think it's going to be as easy to tell as you might think. Now, typically in a talk like this, we'd be talking about the importance of diet and weight control, exercise, adequate sleep, regulation of caffeine consumption, limiting alcohol intake, eliminating tobacco. And they are very important, but I suspect you already know that. And so I'll be talking most of the time about other things. Although I do have a few things to speak about diet and exercise. First, diet, which is very simple. If it tastes good, spit it out. <laughs> Seriously, I do have a few things to talk about diet because of the epidemic of obesity we have in our country, especially in our children. This is the first generation that we're saying the lifespan we expect will be less for this generation of children than it is for the previous generations because of the obesity epidemic. And I don't feel diets are much help. Yes, you can lose some pounds with the many diets that are out, but almost all the studies indicate that as soon as you go off the diet, the pounds come back. The only real solution is to look at where those extra calories are coming from in your diet and then make a permanent, I emphasize permanent, dietary change. A dietitian consultant can be very helpful in many ways, especially for suggestions for how do I eat out in a sensible fashion? How do I shop for groceries? How do I read labels? I also believe exercise is critically important. I've been a regular exerciser at least for the last 35 years. I believe that, and I recommend that you should have, uh, we should all have 30 to 60 minutes of, of aerobic exercise at least four or five days a week. An excellent resource 
to determine how much walking is equal to how much running is equal to how much swimming is equal to how much tennis is Dr. Kenneth Cooper's book on aerobics. I also recommend how, uh, seeing how much painless exercise you can build into your life. By that I mean taking the elevator instead of the stairs routinely. I'm sorry, taking the stairs instead of the <laughs> elevator <laughs> routinely. Uh, parking further away from the store when you're going shopping. I make a game for myself to see how many places, how many errands I can run without moving my car. So far my record is parking by the old dairy, stopping at the library, mailing a package at the post office, paying our water bill at City Hall, picking up a prescription at Walgreens, picking up a few groceries at Neiman's, heading back to the square for, to hit both bookstores and then back to the old dairy for lunch. Now for the fruit and veggies of my talk. Notice I didn't say the meat of my talk. That's outmoded. <laughs> Pay attention to your genetics. It matters if you had a father that developed high blood pressure at 40 or heart disease at 50 or if your mother developed breast cancer at 55 or your uncle developed um, uh, colon cancer at 45. For most health measures, there are good preventive uh, measures. <laughs> Both health, most health issues, there are good preventive measures that can be taken that really do matter to maximize the length and quality of life. And I want to talk specifically to the men in the audience right now. If you have chest pain with exertion, persistent bleeding from the rectum, blood in your urine, or a sore that won't heal, I recommend that you mention it to your significant other and then wait patiently until one or both of you can't stand it anymore and then and only then go to your doctor. That way you can maximize your suffering and increase the chances that uh, what you have will be incurable. <laughs> now for those non-English majors in the office, I hope you can recognize irony and sarcasm. <laughs> Obviously I don't believe that. Unfortunately, um, I got into medicine because I waited uh, when I shouldn't have. In 1963, after my senior year, uh, cross country in high school. I um, felt a little sick one night uh, on my way to work as a stock boy at the local hardware store. Wasn't sure what was going on, but in my family the, uh, the rule was uh, suck it up and go. And I had a father who was as stoic as anybody that I've ever mentioned. And uh, being in pain or recognizing pain was not acceptable. So I went home that night went to school the next day, went to work that night again. Friday morning, the third day, I went to school and passed out in my second hour English class. And so the school nurse made me go home. My parents watched me for a few hours, then took me to the family doctor who recognized I was sick, ended up in the emergency room. To make a long story short, I had a ruptured appendix. The surgeon told my parents that it had probably been ruptured for over 24 hours. And uh, I was in the hospital for 12 days instead of the usual two days. So I paid a significant price for ignoring my pain. We have pain for a reason. I want to talk a little bit with you about Dr. Paul Brand, who's an orthopedic surgeon who has some very definite ideas about pain. Dr. Brand spent the first few years of his life with his missionary parents in India. And then as often as the case, his parents sent him to Great Britain when he got to elementary school so that he could further his education, which he did. And uh, in, uh, as he was finishing college, World War II was starting. And so he was in London uh, during the bad days of the Blitz and uh, got interested in medicine and trained as an orthopedic surgeon. So in the late 1940s, he went back to India now, one of the things that fascinated him was the patients with leprosy who had horribly deformed hands and feet. And he was intrigued by, you know, could something be done? But the problem was nobody knew what caused leprosy. Nobody knew why they lost fingers and toes. And one day, he uh, was going on rounds in the compound where he was living, and he had a 10-year-old boy with him. And there was a, a shed that they wanted to get open. There was a rusted padlock on the shed. And he couldn't get it open. Now, orthopods are known for having strong hands, but he couldn't get it open. 
And the 10-year-old said, let me see if I can help. And so the boy just twisted it right off the hasp. And Dr. Brand was amazed until he looked at his fingers, and his fingers were shredded to the bone. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, the light went on. One of the primary characteristics of leprosy is a loss of sensation to the skin. And so this young man did not know, his body was not telling him when he was exerting too much pressure as he was turning that lock. And that was what was causing them to lose fingers and toes because they had no feedback. They could sprain an ankle and walk on the end of their uh, lower leg bones and uh, not feel it. Now, Dr. Brand says that pain is literally life-saving, and I believe that it is. C.S. Lewis has said that pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world. We have feedback mechanisms in our body to help keep us on course. If we pay attention to our senses, if we can maximize the quality of our lives. Our pain uh, may be manifest as discomfort, distress, anxiety, moodiness, uh, but if we pay a chance, pay attention to it, we have a chance to correct it. Now, I don't know about you, but when things are going very well in my life, I don't want anything to change. But when I'm in pain, I'll look at just about anything to change it. Now, one form of pain is, is uh, the pain of distress uh, from stress itself. Now, stress is an incredible issue and, and often brings people to our office. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Dr. Herbert Benson, who is a cardiologist at Harvard. In the 1960s, when he was looking for his uh, uh, research topic, uh, he, he uh, began thinking about the fight or flight response. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. That's what happens if you're going to go across a busy street and look up and all of a sudden you're going to get hit by a car if you don't get out of the way in a hurry. A fight or flight response is what enables us to get out of the way in a hurry. It increases our blood pressure and our pulse, increases the blood flow to the muscles, increases the blood sugar so that we've got fuel to get out of the way and we can get out of the way. But the problem is in our overstimulated society, the fight or flight response is activated way too often and often when there's no car coming. Now, Dr. Benson wondered uh, at the time uh, the Beatles had popularized transcendental meditation. And so Dr. Benson wondered if you could reverse the fight or flight response with meditation. And so he began studying that. And indeed, he found that there was what he called the relaxation response, which reversed the fight or flight response. And by doing that, uh, could decrease pulse and blood pressure, the severity of pain, insomnia, PMS, uh, reduced nausea and vomiting with chemotherapy, uh, cardiac uh, irregular rhythms, headaches, and among other things. However, some of his subjects became uncomfortable using the words that they were asked to use to uh, induce meditation. Words like peace, one, ocean, love, or relax. So they asked Dr. Benson, if it would be okay if they used a phrase that they were a little more comfortable with uh, from their uh, religious life, like Shalom, or Our Father who art in heaven, the Lord is my shepherd, or Hail Mary, full of grace. And those people, when they used phrases that they were more comfortable with, had a higher success rate in inducing the relaxation response. Addiction medicine is the newest medical specialty through very elegant research involving MRI scans and other technology, we've been able to find more about the biochemistry and physiology of the brain and found that their brain uh, and peripheral nervous systems for both the fight or flight and the relaxation response. Uh, fight or flight is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system and the midbrain and the midbrain. The relaxation response is mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system, which also has manifestations in the midbrain uh, in a part called the limbic system. None of this is in the cortex or the thinking part of the brain. Interestingly enough, 25% of those people who were successful at eliciting the, eliciting the relaxation response described feeling more spiritual afterwards. 
they describe two components of this. One, they experience the presence of an energy, force, or power that is beyond themselves, which they often identify as God. And two, the presence feels very close to them. And Dr. Benson has written a book called Timeless Healing, and he believes that we're actually hardwired for faith. And he's not the only professional that thinks that. Dr. George Ballant is a psychiatrist also at Harvard who spent uh, his adult life uh, at Harvard being in charge of the Adult Growth and Development Project. It's a 60-year uh, project uh, observing people over uh, the long run, and he's been head of it himself for 35 years. He also has been an advisor uh, for their alcohol treatment uh, program. Now, because of the unprecedented growth in our understanding of brain chemistry, uh, He's written a book that he calls Spiritual Evolution, A Scientific Defense of Faith. He feels that psychiatry's emphasis on dealing with the negative emotions, such as uh, hate, fear, and worry, are misplaced. And that actually what the churches have taught for years regarding healthy spirituality actually does more to promote health than the traditional psychiatric attention to the negative. Now the Negative emotions primarily have to do with the self and the past, and the positive emotions have more to do with others and the future. Another psychiatrist by the name of Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Traveled uh, some years ago, gave an address to the American Psychiatric Association in 1992 in which he chastised his colleagues for ignoring the part that spirituality played in their, in their patients' lives. Uh, in fact, it hit home so hard that for the last 20 years, the Joint Commission on Accreditation for Hospitals uh, has made it a standard that when a patient comes into the hospital, uh, we are required to inquire about their uh, spiritual uh, views. That's also true of mental health and addictions uh, programs. The reason for that is that uh, we get a more complete picture of that person's belief system, and it makes, has a tremendous impact on the care of that person. Now, I first got a glimpse of that when I was a senior in medical school. Uh, I was very frustrated with the answers I got in medical school because they told me basically that interpersonal communications, particularly in stressful situations, was not something you could teach. I knew that was the wrong answer, but of course, I couldn't convince anybody in the medical school that that was the wrong answer. And uh, at the time we had met a hospital chaplain. Uh, my wife's father was killed in an accident. And uh, so we met the hospital chaplain. He said, oh yeah, sure, we train people all the time in that, seminary students. And I said, well, I'm not a seminary student. He said, well, we can take care of that. And so I spent three months selective uh, in my senior year of medical school as a hospital chaplain in training. And during that time, People told me things of uh, very deep importance to them that absolutely amazed me. And it took me probably 15 years in practice before I developed that level of trust from the people that I took care of in my medical practice. So obviously, somebody who's there just to care for what's happening to you has a valid role. Over 30 years ago, I was taking care of three football coaches and their families. One of them developed a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and died within nine months. The second developed bone cancer in his back and was dead within two and a half years. The third developed severe stress in his family and I'm sure it was because of what was his colleagues were going through. But its effect on me was devastating. I felt personally responsible, even though I had referred them to the best treatment centers that uh, uh, we have in this country, uh, nothing that we could do could stem the downward tide for them. It felt like everything that I touched turned bad. I remember sitting in my office one night surrounded by my textbooks and my journals, all purporting to tell me the truth. Yet. In the few short years between when I graduated from medical school and when I sat there in despair, the 
recommended treatments for diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and many other things had changed drastically. And so the truth seemed to be a moving target. But then some words came to me that I'd been required to, me to uh, memorize in eighth grade confirmation. And I want to quote them. They're from the uh, well-known chapter on love that's often quoted at, uh, at weddings from the uh, book of 1 Corinthians. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect and our prophecy is imperfect, but when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I came a man, became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. I still find it amazing that those words written 2,000 years ago did more to speak to me and my despair at that particular moment than all my fancy textbooks and journals. I realized at that point that my own spirituality had been put up on a shelf with all my other mem memorabilia and uh, maybe I needed to take it down and look at it to see if it might help me in my day-to-day -day life. I had gone to grad school in my professional life, but I was still in kindergarten in my spiritual life. So what did I learn in my personal quest? In our electronically hyper-connected world, I found that I needed to find ways to center myself on a daily basis. I believe each of us has an inner compass that will help us discover our path in life but it usually doesn't shout at us unless it gets bad. Most of the time, our inner compass speaks in a very quiet voice that we must deliberately listen for. In order to do that, we need to turn off our iPods, our cell phones, our TVs, and our radios, and to get somewhere out of the noise of the world in order to focus on ourselves inwardly. We can't know Excuse me, we can't get somewhere if we don't know where we're supposed to go. Too often we're told, don't just stand there, do something. But I think it's equally important to say, don't just do something, stand there and think. Now, I want to take a, a minute out here to talk a little bit about time management because it's so important. Where do I find the time to do this? Ben Franklin said, dost thou love life? and do not squander time, for that is the stuff that life is made of. We are an incredibly overscheduled, overstimulated people who are too often in a hurry. Gandhi said, there is more to life than increasing its speed. I suggest that each of us daily needs to ask the following questions. What do I need to do today? What do I want to do today? How am I today? What are the needs and wants of my significant others? And how does that fit into my life? That daily routine will be different for each of us. My best time is in the morning. Yours may be at noon, maybe in the evening, or maybe another time. Otherwise, the have-tos of our lives eliminate the want-tos. I like former President Eisenhower's ideas on this subject. He said that most things that are truly important aren't that urgent. And most things are, that are urgent are not really that important in the overall scheme of things. So he recommended that we rate all of our tasks uh, in terms of urgency and importance. And if it's urgent and important, that we do it ourselves right away. <clears throat> if it's important, but not necessarily urgent, that we do it in a timely fashion ourselves. If it's urgent, but not important, that we delegate everything we possibly can and if it's not urgent and not important, forget it. <laughs> we need to live one day at a time. Today is all we have. Today is all we need. Today is really all we can handle. Is life a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing? Or do I have unique capabilities that enable me to do something purposeful with my life? Maybe even someone, something no one else is equipped to do. Unless you are an identical twin, 
Your DNA is different than anyone else's in this world. How do you know how to find your purpose? That's where spirituality comes into play. I want to share the thoughts of Dr. Hans Selye, probably the world's foremost researcher in stress, uh, the stress effects on the human body. I want to quote him. Uh, he's uh, given this uh, quote in a couple of the books that he's read, that he's written, I should say. It's strange that what I value most as my reward for the time spent on dissecting the stress mechanism is not a medical but a philosophic lesson. In an age largely governed by intellect as ours, it is gratifying to learn that much of what religions and philosophies have taught as doctrines to guide our conduct is based on scientifically understandable biologic truths. Never forget that the only treasure that is yours forever is your ability to earn the love of your neighbors. Unpredictable social change can suddenly deprive you of all the money, real estate, or political power that you are able to accumulate. But what you have learned is yours for life and is your safest investment. Work on that. Lost wars, social upheavals, and political changes have deprived and continue to deprive some of the mightiest of all their possessions overnight. History has shown us again and again that thousands of powerful aristocrats, eminent members of religious and political or racial groups, have suddenly become destitute after an unpredictable event made their privileges worthless. Among them, only those escaped this fate who had always invested in themselves in their own ability to earn their neighbor's love. I'm sure you've heard of a book that was written by Rick Warren not too many years ago. He's the lead pastor of a megachurch in California, Saddleback Church. The purpose-driven life can be summarized <coughs> with the first sentence in the book. It's not about you. In closing, I recommend that you think seriously about affiliating with a community of faith, be it a church, a synagogue, or a mosque. There you should feel welcome. Your question should be welcome. Most of the time you should leave feeling refreshed and renewed. <coughs> Excuse me. Communities of faith should not be museums for saints but should be hospitals for us imperfect souls. <coughs> it has been said that the clergy's rule is to role is to comfort the afflicted, but at times also to afflict the comfortable. We need to hear the importance of gratitude, of being thankful for what we have instead of being resentful of those things we don't have. We need to know the importance of forgiveness and need help with and permission to grieve for those things we have lost. As I end this talk, I want to challenge you to monitor yourselves in terms of how you feel right this minute, and then again after I read the following words that are from the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Lord, grant that I may not so much seek to be comforted as to comfort, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And thank you for your patience. <clears throat>